Thanks to all of our sponsors and thanks to you for the great work you do. Okay, we're continuing our precision nutrient management session for the afternoon. We've got three great talks coming up. We're gonna kick it off with Logan Hockey. He is a 4R certified crop advisor here locally and he'll tell you more about what he does and what his organization does with Legacy. Yeah, so uh, thank you for having me here. Um, <clears throat> So everybody's probably seen this slide already once or twice or three times here. Um, so we're taking what we talked about this morning and trying to turn it into how to document uh, the record keeping, what kind of software programs may be out there, um, how to bring this all together. So um, Legacy Farmers, for those of you who don't know, we're lo located basically right in the heart of the Western Lake Erie Basin. Um, out of Finley is the main office. Um, I'm actually located in Henry County, so we're right in the heart of it. Um, so some of the things, uh, we'll start just a little bit on the 4R side of it, and then we'll s flip over and how to put it all together. Um, so why are we here? Why is the documentation important? Um, so we go back to 2011 um, when we had the worst algae bloom uh, in the history of the lake. Um, and you can see there where it's setting right in the western basin. Um, all the way all the way through September and finally moved out in October. So I put this slide together back in 2000, I think it's 13, um, when the 4R was just being introduced. Uh, some of the concepts, what we were trying to uh, reflect, why are, why are we doing this? Why are we collecting all this information? Why are we tracking it? Why are we trying to change some practices? Um, and as a retailer, why, why we want to record this and, and promote it? Um, so, again, this was back in 13, 14, um, right when the um, 4R process was starting. Um, I said we need to get the bullseye off the farmer's back um, and the egg because that was their first initial target. Environmental results, um, some of the, with the algae blooms in the lake, um, how that affects us economically as far as how we change our practices, the amount of fertilizer we can apply, and then we're trying to prevent regulation pressure. So if we look at that list from that point in time to now in the last four years, every one of those points have pretty much hit. You know, we're trying to prevent all that, but it's all happened one way, shape, or form. So just a little bit of a timeline. Uh, 2011, and then we jump to uh, the introduction of the 4R. Um, in 2012-13, audit processes just start. We're getting some certifications. We are fortunate enough to be one of the first ones uh, as part of that process and getting certified. And then we had August of 2014 when the Toledo crisis happened. So in that short period of time, all this just trickled down and we got to where we are now. So now currently we do have legislation and that's why this documentation portion is gonna be important. So we heard John talk this morning on different applicator uh, equipment potentially. Um, uh, soil sampling, that side of it. Uh, right now we have uh, what's certified is we got um, 2.7 million acres under certification, 7 million roughly in the basin, 76% uh, of that is cropland, and whole Ohio represents 70% of that. So how do we keep in compliance with all the 4R, the record keeping, and bring all this back? So. Here's some GIS systems um, that are currently used. Um, it's only a select few of them. I think uh, I talked to John Deere. They were just at a conference out west. There's, they had 700 different software programs trying to find extensions um, to meet up with their My John Deere. So the software business is huge. But we want a GIS system that we can house as much information, build our records, maintain them, go back in history, find out what we did. So here's a few of them that we do. Um, Legacy actually runs uh, Egg Studio right now. Um, what that is is we can build every record in there. We can make our, we can make our maps. We can follow the tri-state. Uh, we can run our soil testing through it, and it is all housed in one location. So that's one of the key points to a good record-keeping system is how much can we keep in one spot. As we move through this, you can, you're going to have multiple extensions. Um, how does that all correlate together? But if we can keep it simple with a program that has some kind of power to the back side of it, 
it's easier to house it and run just one software program. So as we look at through um, a few of these other items up there, we got now we got information that is going out. We can stream out and we can stream it back. So if we look at the paperwork and following the 4R and the uh, documentation portion of it, we have um, this would be some similar to the tri-state. Um, we want to keep yield documentation, our yield goals, our cropping rotations, what kind of credits as far as um, row starters, uh, what exact farm and fields. So when we come, when an audit comes in, which we're actually going to go through the process here in, uh, next week, auditors come in and they pick out a field and we got to document all the way through. So as I continue to talk how this all translates um, all the way to the end, it, they, they dig back and find what you, how you came up with that recommendation. So um, here's some examples of some spreadsheets. Um, when we look back at uh, when we started in 2006 and then we got to 2011, how, how, do we, how do we do it then? It was a lot more spreadsheets. We were not prepared for this documentation world, so that's why the GIS systems come uh, even more prevalent. Um, so here's an example of what that might spit out as far as a recommendation. Um, and this is what would go out to the field. So this is all housed, like I said, inside the program. It gives our max, min's um, rates, make sure we're qualified, yield, yield goals, um, so that we are all um, compliant. So that will translate into a work order system. So our work order systems on the retail side is we can enter that information, stream it, and it goes right into a dispatch system. So this is all housed in a billing, billing system for us. Uh, not every program is like that. Um, a new one out there right now in this area is Ag World. They have a billing and a, and a, and a uh, dispatch and a work order and the process all in one so they can stream to the machines. We also have the John Deere Ag Logic system that can be streamed as a work order out to our machines um, and, and just kind of streamline that. Um, Ag Managed Software or the Ag Vance would be another opportunity so you have your billing and then move it all the way through. So it keeps it cleaner for the grower. Um, all this comes at you know, a cost, but it's just how it would fit your operation. So we probably have a lot of farmers in here. This might not fit, this doesn't fit what you're doing if you're doing this yourselves. But if you're having a retailer or advisor or somebody like that, this is how we stream our information to make sure we can get documentation back to you. So this would be an example of a work order that goes out to um, a spreader, a subsurface applicator, to a grower if they're doing some of their own stuff. Um, it keeps our exact analysis, how many pounds are going out, um, the farm field, and the date on some of this information that is applied. So that is, that is critical to, to make sure we have each one of those line items line up. So we go from GIS systems to making the recs to work orders to filtering it to the cab. So we can stream this to the cab. Now this is where things start getting really important. This is, good, this is important for our farmers, as long as retailers, anybody doing applications. So if, if we think what do we have to do, not only for 4R, but also for legislation now. We have to keep records. So how are we able to keep the records and get them back out? The first part's all easy. We have that all inside. It's, it's coming back from the field. So some of the things that um, tools, we got the on mark, if anybody heard, uh, was in the apps program yesterday, that is a good way for farmers to have that um, app on their phone, iPad, uh, whatever that may be, to collect the information for application, your weather data, uh, and so forth. Um, the next item up there, uh, top middle, that would be like an egg logic dispatch system. So when we're in there, you can enter all your application records, and that'll stream right back to, uh, to house it in, in the office. Um, the 2630, um, is, for example, is a John Deere, you can get uh, wireless data transfer on these. So all that information that you enter, you can have that wireless transferred back to my John Deere in this case, or even back to your GIS system. 
there's 13 points, and we'll get to it, that we have to keep record of. And that's why as much as we can do in the cab um, is, is important. So uh, farmers, the field view side of it, they got the puck. Um, so that can collect yield data, planting data, and now we can do application data with that. So at a farmer level, that might be a good resource um, for farmers to be able to move that data without having to use pen and paper and then enter it later, or, or however that may be. That is a very important to stream live through uh, an iPad in this instance. Um, we have quite a few guys starting to get on that, especially guys that are doing their own application or using real yield data to transfer back to make recommendations. So the documentation side, what comes out of the cab. So this would be the paper side of it. Um, if you look on the left, that's a work order. There is just about every, every point for legislation that we need to make on the 13 point requirements. The only thing we don't have is our weather data at that point in time as far as forecasting. All our other situations we can either manually enter or um, it has a drop down for it. Also the, um, the other two examples there are as applied maps coming back from the machines. So we can take that as applied map, house in our GIS system, we can have it there to make other recommendations. Um, that is either to bump levels up as far as um, fertility based on yield, or we can take credits from these applications for nitrogen to make variable rate uh, nitrogen applications. So that's all documentation to know what, what we did out on that farm and field. So we're going to flip over to um, the law. So why, why is all this documentation important? So we have the, we have the fertilizer uh, laws right now. We've got Senate Bill 1 and Senate Bill 150. So if we look at Senate Bill 1, the big thing there is the weather forecasting. So that is the toughest part as a retailer, as a farmer, as an environment, anybody doing, doing application. We have to find a way to keep record of 24 hours in advance of what that forecast is before we, before we apply. So right now, it's all paperwork. You print out every morning. Um, the on mark is a, is a tool to be able to record that and have that um, on your phone. But how do we get that all linked together? And that is, the, that is the thing that not everything's a perfect world right now. This is only the beginning stages. So if we skip back, we think about the GIS system. If we have the right GIS system with the right amount of power, we can house more information. And as we keep tagging more things into it, it's going to be important. Um, at a farmer level, farmers are, GIS, GIS systems are coming more reasonable where farmers can have this at their fingertips. Uh, we do that currently where we stream the stuff back to their own uh, office. Um, but it's, we have to keep the record. So how are we going to prove ourselves for not only 4R but also legislation? This all matches up. Um, so we look at 150, it's a licensing. And this is where we get into the record keeping portion. So if we flip, here's the 13 points I was talking about. So the application date, place, number of acres applied, rate of application, total amount of fertilizer applied, the analysis, the individual who applied it, the individual who has a license to or um, is holding the certificate holder, is it uh, injected, incorporated, broadcasting, uh, the weather conditions at the time, uh, is it frozen, snow covered, and also the, uh, the future forecast. So we have to keep records of all that. Everybody that does application. So if we look back at the 4R, we had to, we've been having to do that for the last four or five years, for those who've been involved. And in the last eight months, it's become we have to do this. So um, that's why it's critical to have some kind of software or documentation process to be able to get those records. If anybody comes out and wants to see what you did, um, let's say ODA, wherever that may be, this is what they need to see. So what can farmers do? So if we, if we dig down into, um, we start getting into the current soil test. That is one key ingredient to, um, for our certification, is every three to four years, we need to have some kind of current soil test. 
and that reflects back and housed in some kind of system. Um, and that may be with an advisor, yourself, or a retailer of some sort. Um, current boundaries, we still struggle with that. For 4R, we got to make sure we recognize setbacks, um, boundary changes, because all this documentation makes sure we're doing the right job. Um, and that's, that's for the farmer also. Um, following tri-state guidelines. So we have to make sure we are following the right guidelines when we're making fertilizer recommendations. When we get an audit or they come and look at this, they will go through and see exactly how you came up with that recommendation and what levels you set it out and how you got there. So yield goals are important. If that may be real-time yield goals coming out of the um, combine, as we talked before, or some of this live streaming back, or it's just um, overall averages of the farmer, you know, 180 bushel corn, 60 bushel beans. We have to document that and make, sh make sure we have it in there of how we came up with that recommendation. Um, nitrogen programs. Uh, for years and years and years, it's always been one-to-one -one or a little over one-to-one. -one. Now it's looking at are we, we need to make sure we have a reasoning we're coming up with our nitrogen recommendation. Um, like I said, exact yield data. Um, uh, the splitting out your nitrogen over a course of time. Um, we're getting to more programs, um, stabilizers being implemented. Those are all questions we get asked and how we can prove that. Um, uh, so I talked about setbacks, some of the setbacks that need to be recognized, waterways, um, wellheads, outlets, as far as um, some called catch basins. Uh, where, where we have water dumping right into the system. So before, we, just, we just might have spread right through that. Or several years back, uh, when grain prices got high, we had a lot of those CRP strips tore out, and now they're going back in, we gotta recognize that again. So, um, for instance, six years ago, we, we reboundered a lot of fields just because the fields we moved 20 foot wider around the edges um, with some of the Commodity prices changing now again, CRP is coming back in and we got that back out there. So a spreader and an operator, they can recognize when they go through, but we gotta make sure we make them shifts prior, uh, ahead of time. Um, so also try something new. So we've had cover crop talks here. Um, it gives an opportunity to widen that window of application opportunity. So we, right now you think about um, our wheat acres are down significantly. Um, we're probably three-quarter corn soybean rotation. Um, our falls seem to be crunched down of when we can get things applied. So how are we going to make these um, restrictions or regulations and be able to still get our fertilizer on at a timely fashion with a fall that seems to be shrinking? So uh, cover crops are important to have out there. Um, as we come into spring, it gives us an opportunity to spread on a growing cover crop such as cereal rye. Um, we do a lot of that right now. Um, it just gives us a broader window. Also shallow placement. Um, we run a 2510 ammonia bar. It subsurface applies the fertilizer below the surface. So when we're looking at some of these weather events, um, we don't have to worry about that forecast as much because we're actually applying the fertilizer below the surface at four inches, and we document that. Um, we also have strip-till units that are out there. Um, that just gives you more of an opportunity to be out there and getting your fertilizer applied than just broadcasting across the top. And then um, on the nitrogen side, like I talked just a little bit ago, uh, the wide drop is uh, an opportunity to break apart that nitrogen cycle. So instead of applying everything up by V5 or everything pre-plant. Um, let's spread that risk out. Let's move it across. Um, let's get some later season V10 to tassel time uh, application in. It might not even be necessary some years. If the, if the moisture isn't there, we got a dry year, we might not want to add the extra in. Um, uh, for instance, a couple years ago when we had the drought, uh, we, kept, we put a lot of in out there and it never got utilized. So that gives another tool to spread that risk out. Um, also, we have uh, some programs. Uh, the equip programs that have been introduced in the Western Lake Area Basin, the GLR 
I dollars, uh, the nutrient reduction program. This allows to bring in some practices for guys to um, get involved in uh, that are similar to the, uh, get them involved in the 4R, so the subsurface placement. Um, so getting the right uh, variable rate would be the, um, the soil testing side of it and variable rate technology, so we're getting the right rates. Um, and also some voluntary programs with the nutrient stewardship reduction program. There's two counties that have about 10 to 12 farmers that have gone through that process just to find a standard and how we're going to get to this point and how we, how we need to adjust our practices. Again, when we look at, at the four R's and any of this legislation, it all comes down to how, how can we prove that we are doing the right things? Um, so it all comes, we've had some farmers where ODA showed up and uh, asking for records, and how can we prove those records? Um, pen and paper is still not a bad thing, it's just how can we make it easier and more efficient? Um, so that's kind of some of the takeaways uh, to go through. So choose a, a GIS system that has some kind of power to it. Um, you know, third party extensions. Um, a lot of these, what that is, is we can have climate coming in, we can have in circuit coming in, we can have DTN weather data, we can have um, aerial imagery, we can have my John Deere, all these other extensions coming in one place for you to house that information. Um, find a system that works with one another. Um, like I said, there's multiple GIS systems out there. Um, Every week, if you wanted to, you could have a different software system walking into your door and telling you what their things, the best things in sliced bread. But you gotta find one that works and run with it. And it has the opportunity of new development in it. We don't want anything that's stagnant anymore. Everything's moving 100 mile an hour and we need to figure out, sort through and figure out which ones are right. Um, making an efficient process. So, on an on a ag retail side where we got multiple machines out in the fields, we got um, you know, 50, 100 customers per crop specialist, whatever that may be, per location, we need to find a way, an efficient way to get the, the information back to the grower. The grower needs to get the information to us and we need to make the recommendation, get it out to the spreader and back. How can we make that most efficient? So right now, this wireless data transfer um, as a hot topic, it's figuring out how to perfect that and how to make sure it lines up with everything that we're doing. Um, we want to make sure that, uh, like I said there, there's no perfect combination, but you got to keep thinking about it. Application rhetoric needs to be accurate. So as, as we look at um, what we do, if it's from fertilizer to subsurface placement with a strip till or a, a 2510 bar, um, to manure, whatever that may be, we need to make sure we're keeping calibration records and on that uh, applicator. When our auditors come in, they look at to make sure the last time we did it that we're doing the right thing. Spread patterns. Training of employees and yourselves. Um, there's all kinds of training out there where um, we can help you get set up of what we need to be doing and rec recording and how we need to set up our machines. Um, that is a key thing in the last five years. We've, we've gone training, 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 and how can we get there? Um, you gotta think, we got applicators that may be 65, 70 years old, and we got applicators that are 21 years old. And how do we break that gap and keep everybody on the same page and make sure we're doing the same thing across the board? Um, again, here's calibrate equipment. That's belt calibrations in our case, um, and also spread patterns. Um, every, every year we're going out multiple times doing belt calibrations on different products to make sure the right rates are coming out, and also um, spread patterns to make sure we're getting a consistent um, pattern across the board. Um, we do that on all equipment um, with the different products. And also, I just put up there, like I said, paper is not a bad thing. Not everybody's gonna be able to justify having a GIS system or the technology there. But we need to at least be documenting what we're doing out on the farm. Um, ourselves, you, uh, we provide, we're gonna be providing a sheet for everybody, every farmer that's going out to the field for side dress that to make sure they know that they need to be keeping these records. 
Um, you can go on ODA and find the 13 check list, and they also have an example uh, sheet that we need to be able to keep records. But we're continuing trying to find a way to make this easier. Um, I think the comment was earlier, everybody uh, has a smart form, uh, smartphone pretty near, so uh, there's, there's some apps out there that you can have at home when you're doing your side dress or your own broadcast to make sure you're getting that information in. Um, and then the last thing for the 4R side of it is grower signatures are important. Um, we have signatures that go out to the growers. We ask for them to, to let you know that we're trying to make the right recommendations and you recognize that. This is still a voluntary program, the 4R side of it, but we want to make sure you guys are on the same page with us that we're trying to do the right thing out here. Um, as we keep moving along and more legislation come down the road, um, it just shows that we have continued to try to do the right thing. Um, on the fertilizer side of it, it was voluntary before. Now that is uh, restricted in its legislation. So we got to follow by those rules. So as we, as we keep going down the road, I can't reiter re reiterate it enough, but the documentation portion is going to be important. We have to prove what we're doing is right. Um, and that's from the growers, the retailers, the advisors, all the way through. Um, and hopefully there's a few points out of here or questions that you may have that might be able to help you on what direction to go with um, GIS systems or a way to stream your information back. Um, I got my information up there. Just email me. I'm more than willing to throw some ideas out there. Uh, I've been doing this for... 13 years, I've had several different software programs, played with several of them. There's no exact perfect situation, but you have to just diagnose what fits your operation and break it down um, and ask for advice from others. Um, we're all in this together in one way, shape, or form. It's just how do we, how do we get there uh, the most efficient way. Um, down to about five minutes. If guys have any questions, um, concerns, Shout them out. Logan, how big is your staff? On the precision side, we have about three people, roughly. Um, we have crop specialists. We have nine of them, um, so which is our sales staff, which they help do the documentation and, and get the information back from the farmers to make sure we get that plugged in. Um, so. It's kind of changed from just you know selling product, which we're trying to sell value and make sure we're getting information and doing the right job for our farmers to help protect them. Uh, we also have operation managers. They take care of a lot of the application side of it. Um, so they're housing that work order process. Um, so it's a team effort. We don't have anybody just di uh, diving into one specific or the whole thing. Um, each person has some specific portions of that that they do. Um, on the software side, like I said, we got roughly two to three people that take care of that side of it. What are you using in your work order? Right now, we use EggVantage. Um, it is actually our, our billing system, but they have a work order po portion of it, so we're able to enter um, our work orders match the maps up, it sends to a dispatch system, and then it goes out, and then it streams back. Um, so that's one route we've gone to help, help minimize extra programs um, and, and bring the paperwork trail down to a minimum. Not to say we don't use any paper. We haven't got to that point, but we are down to um, as little as we have to. It's all documented in-house. And we would have every, all information in roughly two to three spots is where we house our information. So, so the way it streams back, so we get stuff back into our advantage. We have stuff in Ag Logic as far as application records, and some of that links back into Ag Studio, our GIS system. So we have, it's that back and forth tr transition of how you get the information back, because uh, it's all built in a process. Um, so we have multiple locations where we could find information if something would, if my GIS system would crash tomorrow, you know, we have it somewhere else. Um, or, 
or the last resort, like I said, is paperwork. Most all this, we have paperwork somewhere. All the weather data forecast right now, we print out every morning the forecast, and then we print it also again at 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock at night, um, depending on how long we're spreading. Uh, and then if we do see a forecast, we look at it, and we uh, print out the accumulative and add up when that gets to an inch. Um, so in the last three years, we've only had two situations where we had to shut down from actually applying fertilizer broadcast. And one was at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The other one, the soils were already saturated. We didn't have to really worry about it. So um, that is a daily process we have to look at. And that's going to be a little bit of a change for the growers because they're not used to having to look at that when they're doing their own applications uh, like in the past. Yes, sir. Yeah, so we got several guys that have uh, edge of field studies going on, um, tile outlet studies going on. Uh, Kevin King, he's highly involved in that in, uh, in Ohio, especially up in northwest Ohio. I know several growers are doing that, and that's for manure, fertilizer, um, and then cover crop situations. So there's a whole range of situations where they are doing some of that studies. Not every one of our far farmers are doing it. We do. We have been introduced to a program where they would. Um, it's called a tile watch, I think it was. Um, we just haven't broke that out yet just because we don't, we're trying to figure out how, what it's actually reading. Um, but a farmer would be able to access that and use that on their own operations just to see what they're potentially losing. Um, it's just getting organized to be able to, to bring, bring that, present that to the grower. Um, we do do nitrogen samples quite a bit, watch that nitrogen profile, how it moves throughout the growing season on the nitrogen side of the nutrients uh, end of it. I would say they're very proactive. Um, it's just we got to figure it out now. I mean, if you're going to if, if you're going to reject or not want to be a part of it, you're going to get behind the eight ball. Uh, right now, you're trying to stay ahead of that curve. And what can we do to help the situation bring other services to help uh, gather the information? Uh, if you look at Ontario, they're actually going to um, bring forth a pilot or maybe the actual 4R here coming this fall. They're um, they're getting involved. I actually did a presentation up there a couple weeks ago. They're trying to get their growers voluntary because they're afraid that they might have some kind of um, restriction come down the line. If you look at Northwest Ohio, and when you come across uh, in Ontario, just uh, through Detroit there, and through Windsor, you move across the countryside there, it looks identical to what we have in Northwest Ohio. So it's a very similar situation. And they're being as proactive also. Um, how, how can we help? How can we get our growers' minds uh, looking at stuff new, how can we have them start recording information uh, just to get used to it. Um, our situation, it, it snowballed real fast. All, we went from having 2011 to introducing 4R, and then we had the 2014 crisis all in a matter of eight months. Um, and we had to figure this thing out quick. Um, they're trying to get ahead of that. I know Illinois and Iowa, they're looking to do it more on the nitrogen end as we look at the golf side of it. Uh, with the dead zone down the golf. They're trying to be as proactive as also of how do we change some of our practices or how do we keep record of what we're doing to show we are doing the right thing um, and not just putting product out. Yes, last question. But 
I don't. Oh, uh, for the for these edge of field studies. For northern Indiana, I test my runoff water for my own information so I know what I'm losing. Uh, my drain tile after a heavy rainfall event, uh, those run five parts per million is what the test came back. The crick was at 10 parts per million. Now, is five acceptable and should it be lower? I honestly cannot answer that question. I don't know where the acceptable ranges are. Um, I don't know if anybody in here does. Okay. Yeah, that's what he's saying. I, I'm not sure what's acceptable. Repeat, repeat that. What uh, public health is below 10. Yeah. Keep it below 10. Um, but yeah, I don't know what they're saying exactly <laughs> acceptable. I, that's a, a question from the back. Are we talking dissolved or total phosphorus or nitrogen? Talking nitrogen. 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 Okay. That's what I didn't know. Why don't yeah. we to have more of that discussion offline as we transition the next speaker and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Please.